Good afternoon, Vijay. Good to have you at Harassus. Uh, I believe it's your ninth time that you're visiting and uh, good to have you with us. Uh, thank you, thank you, Neetu. Delighted to be here. As we well. love it as uh, if you can introduce yourself and what you do and what brings you here and your interests. Let's start with that. Okay, I'm Vijay Sandamurthy. I'm the founder and managing partner of Lexogen. Uh, we are an India headquartered law firm that I founded in 2006 in Bangalore. We have, uh, you know, uh, pan-Indian coverage. A couple of years ago, I moved to Singapore to set up our Singapore office to expand into the Asia Pacific region to focus more on cross-border transactions over there. Broadly speaking, uh, we do a lot of uh, advisory work on transactions in a few key areas. Uh, for example, we do a lot of fund formation work where we help in the setup of private equity, venture capital, and hedge funds. We do a lot of advisory work where we advise private equity and venture capital funds and hedge funds, family offices, etc., uh, on their investments into companies. We also advise some companies on raising investments from these funds. And we also do a lot of mergers and acquisitions work. Uh, in, a, in a range of sectors, but with a particularly strong offering in sectors like technology, uh, infrastructure projects, consumer, f and and so on. So let's start with uh, what is key to you is the legal aspect. So how can legal frameworks and services facilitate the rapid transition of the Indo-Pacific region into a high income growth economy, especially post COVID? Well, I would say that the Indo Pacific region is a hugely undertapped opportunity on both sides, I would say. And um, in some ways, a sort of black swan event like the COVID pandemic has uh, the potential to stir up the opportunity and realize it. In, in ways that both sides hadn't thought possible earlier. So uh, speaking as somebody with a definitely a much deeper understanding of the uh, in Indian part of the equation, I would say that the uh, pandemic has given rise to much more awareness of the inadequacies of either side of the equation. So the Indian uh, you know, leaders and you know, business leaders as well as the political leaders have seen that some of the aspects of our supply chain uh, were shown to be not very great. Similarly, say if you take a market like Australia or Southeast Asia or you know the rest of the Indo-Pacific, uh, rest of the Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific region, though they have developed economies with uh, you know greater level of resources, they too found themselves coming up short due to some of the challenges posed by the pandemic. So what this really means is, in terms of opportunity, both Indian businesses and uh, you know, uh, Asia Pacific businesses uh, can actually win and win big by cooperating, by identifying the areas where they need each other's help. You know, India is always viewed as a huge market, but what people don't realize is we are also uh, a, a good mix of a great market, a great talent pool, and a great manufacturing base now, thanks to our prime ministers and government's efforts to push, uh, you know, make it India as we call it. So there's a lot of opportunities waiting to be tapped. And speaking from the prison of a lawyer, I would say that uh, you know the legal frameworks as a, are as important as the political and economic frameworks that you have. So in your view, what is the role of law in aiding the recovery of production units and supply chains affected by COVID pandemic in the Indo-Pacific region? Hmm. The role of law is always extremely important. I mean, obviously I say that, uh, you know, it may sound like a statement with a vested interest, but it's true. People don't realize that when they are looking at a supply chain problem or a supply chain issue, they're not really necessarily dealing with a legal issue, but that couldn't be uh, more wrong in my view. I think what needs to uh, happen is people need to look at some level at why the supply chains were not optimal in the first place 
And some of the reasons for that was that we did not have the enabling legal frameworks. So I think that both sides uh, in the in the Indo-Pacific equation need to understand that there are some legal reforms that would be required both internally and externally. Now, what do I mean by internally? Internally, some laws need to be made in both the countries to better facilitate participation. For example, uh, certain uh, investments in certain sectors could be restricted in both, uh, you know, both regions or both countries, and those need to be looked at in a little more strategic uh, sort of fashion. External could be, for example, uh, you know, uh, free trade agreements. India could explore a free trade agreement which it is doing with Australia and also with uh, some of the states in Australia. Now these need to be given teeth to, so they need to become uh, more credible and also industry needs to act up as well. They need to have a harmonious, uh, uh, you know, uh, empowering of industry and the way to do it is, is by policy reform. So that's where the legal framework kicks in as well. So from a legal perspective, which sectors in India and Australia do you see attracting greater investment and innovation? And how should legal strategies be tailored to these sectors? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I would say, uh, you know, historically, uh, you know, Australians have been very strong, for example, in sectors like mining, in sectors like infrastructure. Uh, and by infrastructure, I, I mean both uh, dirty infrastructure or the old uh, you know, infrastructure projects that uh, left a huge carbon footprint to also the new clean uh, green infrastructure like, you know, green hydrogen projects, etc. Those are all areas where, say, Australia, for example, is very strong. And India has been very, very strong in, uh, you know, uh, more of the knowledge economy industries. Our, our talent pool is considered uh, the best in the world and uh, especially in areas like technology, uh, you know, data sciences, uh, AI analytics and so on, but even in areas like, uh, even in areas like biotechnology and pharmaceuticals, Indian companies have made giant strides over the last 20 years. We used to be largely known as a land of, uh, you know, copy and paste actors in the business side, but I think the Pharma and biotech industry too has made tremendous progress. So that's again a big area where the Indian side can, uh, you know, uh, uh, contribute to Australia and to the rest of the uh, APAC region. I would also say another area where both countries could benefit is uh, mutually is tourism. So one big factor is that both countries need to look at opening up more air travel routes. Currently, for example, the connectivity between Australia and India is not great. There's not enough of uh, you know, direct uh, flights. So as a result, the business community doesn't get to travel there. And it's, that is why another reason why events like the Horasis India meeting are great because they bring the business community, uh, community together. But I think the governments and the uh, you know tourism industry and the airlines industry uh, need to kind of uh, wake up and to deepen the opportunities available. So how do you believe legal education impacts the industry and what changes do you think are necessary in legal education to meet contemporary challenges? Well, legal education is not a direct, uh, you know, uh, contributory to these kind of changes. But it is a, it is oh, like, let's call it the legal awareness. Yeah, I would say that legal awareness is definitely a very important factor. And, um, you know, speaking from my own Indian experience, I have seen, uh, you know, over the last uh, 26 plus years that I've been a transactional lawyer, that, you know, it used to be abysmal. The level of awareness of law even amongst fairly established businesses used to be abysmal. And uh, more importantly, the level of awareness of the importance of having good legal advice used to be terrible. But that is changing. And, and just like the Indian industry has evolved from being you know, largely feeding off of our, an outsourcing boom to becoming 
global thought leaders in management, global best practices, what has also emerged is a much keener understanding of the importance of having good legal counsel. And that's why premium legal firms such as ourselves uh, have the ability to command uh, you know, a great clientele uh, whose trust you know, keeps us going. So therefore, I, I think absolutely it's very important uh, to have very good legal counsel and to have a good awareness of uh, you know, law and you know, good governance. It's becoming even more important. So taking from trust, I mean, uh, uh, every country wants new investments coming in and uh, collaborations to happen. Uh, with regards to India, mm -hmm. there's always, or has been, I'm not sure, you can educate me here, is there's always been a fear factor in terms of would my investments be safe, uh, would it be secure? Ha do you see a huge shift that's happened in the terms of legal advice or legal regulations like the you know the uh, as you said you really participate in the mergers and acquisition Absolutely. do you feel it's become simpler or has it become more complicated to put away the investors do they feel secure now in today's regulatory systems so let me answer it by putting it like this it has certainly not become simpler and but the reason for that is not that the legal system has become more complex it is because the industrial needs, business needs have become more complex. So when, when the size of the market was really small, relative to that opportunity, the level of complexity people had to deal with as foreign investors coming into India was very, very high. So that's why in the early days of liberalization, if you, if you think back to India's liberalization, it happened in the early 90s. And I was very fortunate to be uh, you know, coming out of law school as a fresh uh, graduate at that time when you know, a lot of exciting work was happening. Now, there used to be a lot of uh, fear in those days about whether, you know, even basic stuff like, will we get our money back? Will we be allowed to repatriate our funds back? So, and justly so, because the legal framework for the, for the small size of the opportunity that it was, was tremendously complex and very often a lot of companies said, we'll just wait, we'll just pass on India, we'll focus on China. But over the last 20 to 25 years, uh, I'm very pleased to say that the uh, Indian opportunity is being seen as more and more credible. There have been certainly setbacks. For example, there have been, there have been some uh, you know, recessionary periods where people have lost money. Uh, there have been the concerns around exchange rate slippages due to which on, on account of foreign exchange fluctuations, people who have lost the value of their investment. So, but despite all that, if, some, if somebody takes a reasonably medium to long-term view of India, I will go out on a limb and say this, and as, I, as I've been saying for the last 20 years, that it's certainly one of the most compelling business opportunities and investment opportunities in the world, okay? Because, uh, because what we have is not just you know, 1.4 billion people market. We have a very, very sound legal system now that's well understood. It's modeled on the common law system, but we have an evolved set of jurisprudence now that works. Uh, in my early days of uh, career as a lawyer, people used to often, uh, you know, scoff at us and say, what is the use of getting a legal opinion or a contract here? Because most of it is non-enforceable in practical terms. And I can say that even the legal industry and the understanding of the legal industry has evolved. I think uh, the competence of the legal industry too has matured over the years. So uh, I think we are, I won't say that it's perfect. We are still a work in progress in terms of, uh, I mean, there are certain things that could improve and improve a lot in some ways. But I would say that in balance, we have done a fantastic job in not just creating the economic opportunity, but in creating the uh, legal system to defend that option. Great, so the way I look at it is, Harassa seems to be a beautiful haven for you where you're gonna meet um, investors, people who want to have merchants and actors. So for you, this must be quite a treat. Yes, so, you know, like is the case with most people who are part of the Harassa's community, it all started with a discussion with Frank uh, Richter, who's the chairman of Harassa's and who's now become a very good friend. And uh, 
So uh, it's my eighth or ninth year running as part of the Hadassus community and I always found it uh, an absolute pleasure to be attending the Hadassus events and uh, I, I find it a very productive use of my time. Uh, you know, one often has to make the time for it because it's often held in different parts of the world. So it becomes challenging sometimes, but it's, it's always worth uh, my time, I feel. Because it's not just about, uh, you know, the quality of content and the quality of the format of the event, but it's also the quality of people that are there as co-panelists and, you know, other speakers and, you know, other attendees who have over the years, several of whom have become good friends and several of whom have become clients. So it's a very satisfying feeling, but you know, that kind of thing doesn't happen overnight. You have to invest the time and effort in, in, uh, in building that bond with the Vanessa's community. But it's been a wonderful journey for me and I'd highly encourage uh, everybody else to give it a shot. So in Adelaide, what is the one key takeaway that you have? I think the one key takeaway is, um, on a funny note, despite the fact that we lost to the Australians in the World Cup final, I still have to say it is a beautiful stadium they have here, the Adelaide Oval. We had the pleasure of having dinner there and overlooking the Adelaide Oval, and that is a delight for me. But on a more serious business note, I think there are tremendous opportunities which I have personally uh, discovered more about, uh, especially in my conversations with people from South Australia, because that's uh, you know that's the state where Adelaide is, and I, in my con conversations with some entrepreneurs and investors from here, uh, I have learned of some very very interesting you know you know progress and uh, efforts being made, especially in the renewable and clean energy space. There's a lot of action happening, say in green hydrogen and stuff like that, which I think is very exciting. I think there's a lot of um, you know, ground to be covered in Indo-Australian relations, and I think uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I feel very confident and hopeful that uh, you know myself and Lexogen will be a part of that, uh, you know, helping that journey of entrepreneurs from both sides and investors from both sides do business with each other. Great, thank you for being with us, and look forward to seeing you in Vietnam for the Asia Meet, dated. 3rd and 4th of December. Thank Absolutely. you so much for Thank your you. time. Thank Thanks. You.